Uh, what I will do is to provide an overview, but also to share some uh, good practices for European SMEs uh, who has a supply chain in China. The uh, little bit on the background uh, information, the global supply chain has been undergoing significant changes in recent years, uh, driven by uh, various factors such as uh, digitalization, the trade tensions between the uh, different um, bodies of the world, and of course the COVID-19 pandemic in the past few years. Um, among the most uh, key shifts has been the growing uh, importance also uh, with EU-China supply chain, which has emerged as a critical link in the global value chain. Uh, the EU-China supply chain has witnessed uh, significant growth in the recent years, uh, driven by China's increasing role as a global manufacturing hub, and also uh, based on the demand from Europe for goods at a competitive uh, price. Uh, however, this growth has not been without uh, challenges as the industries face numerous uncertainties, uh, such as fluctuating demands, such as uh, rising, uh, rising trade barriers, uh, but of course, uh, supply chain disruptions caused by the pandemic. Um, I am the team leader of the EU SME Center when it comes to SMEs in particular, uh, being the important actors in global value chains. Uh, and also a vital component of uh, the EU's economy. But at the same time, uh, SMEs typically have limited uh, limited uh, resources to uh, address and also to manage uh, the supply chain risks properly. And to address these challenges uh, on behalf of SMEs and to explore uh, the future prospects of uh, the EU-China supply chain, uh, that's why today we are hosting this conference, uh, which we are bringing together um, here, uh, players in the industries uh, from the city of Tianjin in China, um, also, of course, supply chain uh, experts uh, in the field, uh, but also uh, SME owners uh, in China, uh, uh, in the city of Tianjin, uh, to discuss all together the latest trends, uh, the best practices, the different uh, strategies for uh, supply chain shifts, and, of course, we try here also to make some predictions uh, to the short future, to the longer term, uh, how the supply chain shifts, uh, what the supply chain shifts will bring to uh, SMEs, to businesses. Uh, before I start, uh, um, I think I no longer can control the slides. Mm -hmm. I would like to say a few words about the EU SME Center for those of you who uh, are not familiar with us uh, yet. The EU SME Center is a project founded by the European Commission uh, already in 2010. Uh, we provide advice for uh, SMEs uh, from uh, European countries uh, to uh, prepare them to do business in China for entering the Chinese markets. Um, the services uh, we have include an advice uh, center where uh, uh, inquiries from SMEs, all sort of inquiry, business inquiries uh, are uh, being answered by our in-house experts team and our field experts in the network. Uh, we also have a self-diagnosis tool where uh, SMEs can do self-assessments -assess on their readiness uh, for entering the Chinese markets. We have a, a training center. We provide face-to-face -face trainings in both Europe uh, and also here in China for SMEs uh, on a wide range of uh, business-related topics uh, to prepare them, again, for uh, uh, market access to China. Uh, we also have an advocacy platform uh, where we leverage on the network of uh, the European Chamber in China. We voice uh, on behalf of SMEs. Uh, we collect feedback on uh, their performance uh, in China, but also the challenges uh, they are encountering uh, when uh, operating their business in China and voice on their behalf. Uh, to the Chinese uh, government authorities and policy makers to constantly uh, uh, improve the business environment for the newcomers uh, from Europe. Last but not least, we also have a knowledge uh, center. Um, over the years, we have published uh, over 200 uh, market studies, uh, guidelines for exports, uh, business articles, case studies, uh, 
uh, starting from uh, uh, the previous phase of the project uh, uh, during uh, the COVID years, we have also started uh, uh, recording all the online webinars uh, we organize and all these uh, webinar recordings, uh, market studies reports can be found on the website of the EU SME Center. And that, of course, uh, includes uh, a few of them uh, who are relevant to today's uh, topic. Uh, as many of you may uh, be uh, familiar with, uh, last year uh, in February, the European Commission has adopted a proposal for a directive on corporate sustainability due diligence, um, which uh, means uh, SMEs who are normally in the supply chains of uh, larger EU players, um, will be impacted and there are stricter rules, uh, tightening regulations that affect the supply chain management for uh, multinationals, but also for SMEs. Um, in today's uh, presentation of mine, I uh, will not uh, go too much into details on this uh, subject, but for, the, for those of you who um, want to learn more about the corporate sustainability due diligence, you are welcome to uh, visit our website. There is a webinar recorded on this very topic. Um, the EUSM Center, we have published uh, a report last year, uh, as well as supply chain management uh, in China, the challenges and good practices for SMEs uh, within uh, industrial goods, but also in many other sectors. Uh, in the report, we talked about managing supply chain, uh, how to manage the supply chain successfully uh, during the pandemic, but also during the post pandemic era. Uh, we shared good practices for European businesses with the uh, supply chains in China. Um, I'm in my presentation later, I, in my sharing later, I'm also going to uh, mention and introduce a few of these uh, uh, practices. Um, but uh, you, uh, again, are welcome to uh, go to the website and download this uh, report and uh, read uh, the full report. So on uh, supply chain uh, strategy shifts, um, the, uh, how to manage, how to uh, ensure supply chain resilience in China and elsewhere. Uh, I start my uh, sharing with uh, uh, an overview um, on uh, the EU-China uh, supply chain shifts. So um, as many of you are familiar already uh, with uh, the fact that Europe's quest for strategic autonomy and economic uh, security has come with uh, repeated goals to reduce its critical uh, dependency on, on China as a systematic rebel. Um, so from the commission um, perspective, uh, President uh, Ursula von der Leyen has called for de-risking, has vowed for Europe to produce at least 40% of its uh, clean tech and also take its economic security interests into account when exporting to China. The same has also been recommended from the European Council uh, for the EU to reduce critical dependencies and vulnerabilities, including in the supply chains, and to de-risk the diversity and to diversify uh, where necessary and appropriate. Um, yet, we also look uh, on the uh, other side of uh, the picture. China's dominance in key strategic sectors and products is uh, at a level that is so overwhelming uh, that partial or total decoupling may not be uh, may not necessarily mean peer risking. Uh, but on the other hand, to the contrary, it might also mean um, um, it can also be a very risky endeavor. So the evidence uh, is telling, despite all the buzz, um, your dependency on China of the past years has only been growing on the grow uh, rather than decreasing. Um, some facts and figures for every five containers shipped from China to uh, the EU, uh, only one is uh, exported to China. Um, and compared to 10 years ago, imports uh, had tripled uh, by the end of last year. And the balance uh, also further deteriorated during the COVID-19 pandemic and also uh, since um, Russia's invasion to Ukraine. And from uh, uh, when it comes to SMEs, uh, there is uh, from the latest figures from um, the European Commission, this trade a mere 3% approximately of all the European SMEs are either exporting to China or importing from China. Uh, out of which uh, only 1.5% of the 25 million European SMEs are currently exporting to China. 
Um, this is an easy calculation to show the uh, exports ratio is uh, relatively low. And in certain sectors, um, we also see that there is hardly any alternative uh, to China. The dependency, uh, for example, in uh, rare earth is 98%, antibiotics 79%. Um, and on the other hand, close to 90% of the global solar panel production um, are in the hands of, uh, of China. Uh, here, well, um, we're talking about two different uh, approach, how companies with supply chains in China has been uh, following. So China's dominance in global supply chain is also one of the main reasons why many businesses are relatively hesitant when it comes to decoupling, uh, as this would mean uh, this would essentially mean leaving the world's second largest economy behind. Uh, however, at the same time, some companies are actually expanding their footprint in China to continue serving uh, its vast internal markets with local production, uh, independent from the rest of the world, and thus becoming resilient to um, any possible further sanctions, for example, or um, and abrupt uh, decoupling that might take place in the future. Um, now, uh, after looking at the uh, overview of uh, uh, the shifts, we look at the shifts themselves. So what has happened is that in the past years, the global economic landscape is also uh, gradually changing. Um, both the EU and China now are seeking to uh, preserve and develop uh, their own economies, their own countries' manufacturing capabilities, uh, and this also complicates eventually the global social strategies for companies. On the other hand, there's rising tariffs, uh, there's constraints in technology transfer, um, there's also financial incentives that add to the existing pressure, this especially... Um, are concentrated in sectors uh, who are deemed uh, strategically important. Uh, and we can already name a few, for example, solar panels, uh, photovoltaic sectors, for example, ships, for example, batteries. Um, and being in China, we have also witnessed and uh, constantly witnessing the growing, growing local competition uh, from the pr consumer perspective in the eyes of Chinese consumers. There is also a stronger um, local, um, there are strong local competitors who have uh, eclipsed a certain once powerful Western brands. So uh, we can name a few um, Chinese brands, Chinese uh, companies who are also receiving success globally and also in the European markets. And this is also one of the factors we cannot uh, neglect. Uh, this is also making China a tougher market for many multinational players and eventually where many of the SMEs are on the supply chain from. Um, however, uh, we also look at um, the attractions uh, still of, uh, of, uh, of China, of Chinese markets. So for global companies, uh, China's skilled labor force, uh, extensive supplier ecosystem, uh, fast growing domestic markets, domestic demands have uh, for a very long time acted as a um, magnet for manufacturers. Um, there are uh, also uh, a number of uh, competitive advantages offered by the industrial clusters, uh, industrial zones in China, uh, for example, uh, the Suzhou Industrial Park, where many uh, companies uh, from the semiconductor sector, uh, automotive sector, bio nanotechnology sectors uh, are having their uh, manufacturing uh, bases. Uh, same goes for in the Jiangsu industrial cluster, for pharmaceutical sectors, for renewable energy. Uh, it's a very big country. If we go down south, there is also uh, the SME province of uh, Guangdong, where a number of uh, um, clusters uh, have been uh, very well established in the recent years. And if we go west, there is also uh, the Chengdu and Chongqing region for, for example, electronic appliances, uh, electronic products. 
um, those also represent the attractiveness of uh, of uh, um, the markets that industrial clusters uh, manage to bring. As a result, um, complex, tightly integrated supply chain networks um, are now linking China with the rest of the world. Um, but now also we are coming to a point that many companies have been uh, benefiting Many companies who have been benefiting from these attractions, from these benefits, are asking themselves whether these attractions that made so much strategical sense over the past uh, 10 years, 20 years, uh, still do the same. Uh, and what might come next? Uh, one example that was brought by the COVID-19 pandemic uh, for uh, as economic, but also as operational impacts would be, uh, for example, um, companies who have um, longer distance supply chains or companies who have suppliers that are geographically uh, concentrated uh, might face uh, uh, issues uh, unforeseen. So um, the questions now are uh, being asked uh, by these companies or does this attractiveness remain the same and what might come next? We're coming to a point when companies, especially SMEs, are reassessing the role that China plays in the supply chain. Um, meaning that how can the China, how can China best fit within uh, your global uh, supply chain strategy? Uh, a few questions that uh, have uh, I have listed uh, here as factors for consideration for many of the companies include. Um, one, does the location offer the necessary uh, technologies, uh, IP, R&D uh, capabilities, uh, manufacturing know-how to produce the goods? Of course, this always comes first um, for uh, manufacturers, uh, for companies who choose or choosing manufacturing locations. Uh, how available are uh, skilled labor force? Uh, how robust are the infrastructure? Um, and is there a sustainable upstream supply base? Um, and coming down the list would, of course, be uh, also one of the main factors for consideration is cost efficiency. How do capital operating logistics costs compare with alternative uh, uh, options, alternative locations, uh, locations? And can the products be delivered quickly and cheaply enough eventually to meet uh, the demand of the markets? <laughs> Eventually, uh, being in China, something that cannot be ignored would be the regulatory requirements um, that might come uh, in place. However, having uh, said that, having uh, listed uh, these factors for consideration, the significance and impact of these criteria are uh, also different from sector to sector. This, uh, and also from organization to organization. This, again, is not... Um, is just for uh, a reference for discussion. Some of these factors might not be relevant for all. Um, we are at the SME Center. We, uh, we, we work with companies. We know best what uh, companies, what issues companies uh, face, uh, how they succeed, how they fail. However, we are not a uh, intelligence, uh, we're not the economic intelligence unit. We don't make predictions. That's why I uh, found this interesting um, let's say uh, sort of uh, prediction um, that was uh, from that I uh, quoted from uh, McKinsey. Um, there are different strategies for enhancing resilience, especially when it comes to those who have supply chain in China. I can describe them, um, or these were described in in four different types. So the first type would be for companies that produce in China for China. Uh, for example, uh, these companies can increase, uh, can try to increase the breadth, uh, the, the wideness, uh, the scope, uh, and the depth of their local supply chains. Um, similarly, for the second type, for those companies uh, with consumers in China, with customers in China, but no production in, in China, to try to explore um, localization of some of the manufacturings. This eventually could possibly give uh, um, the cost uh, advantages, agility advantages, uh, while providing also a degree of uh, insulation from future regulatory shifts or logistics challenges. Um, when it comes to companies that uh, produce goods in China, 
uh, but for not the tennis market, but for the rest of the world, uh, may want to again explore diversification, the China plus N strategy. Uh, here means that uh, it involves of, uh, also sourcing new suppliers in, in other regions, uh, for example, in Southeast Asia, uh, or working with uh, existing Chinese suppliers to develop additional uh, manufacturing capacity in, in, in some overseas locations. Again, Southeast Asia could be an example. Um, finally, this mostly uh, apply for uh, multinationals. Uh, for companies that with uh, who has little to now presence in China, uh, again may also want to consider whether the market is really as uh, challenging as uh, impenetrable uh, as uh, they might imagine. So setting up a new uh, China focused business uh, or or brand or uh, uh, a company that is designed to serve the Chinese market, the Chinese uh, consumers. Uh, while being also fed by uh, regionalized supply chains could also prove uh, to be more viable uh, in both uh, economic terms and also regulatory terms. I'm coming to the end of my presentation. Um, since we are having this discussion and this might be the most interesting question for uh, many, uh, of you, especially for the SME owners, uh, uh, to uh, make predictions of what's coming next, uh, and, and ev eventually uh, where uh, to put your uh, supply chains uh, next. Um, again, I listed uh, here a few points for um, for you to consider, but also for our discussion uh, eventually. Uh, a few things that needs to be taken into consideration includes how long will the supply chain shift. Uh, take uh, and of course this can vary from region to region, uh, from sector to sector. Uh, one of the trends uh, that has already um, been uh, um, look, looked at uh, repeatedly is that China's fading attractiveness eventually are highlighting uh, new commercial opportunities in other locations, in other regions, uh, in other areas of the world. Um, in Asia, um, in India and Southeast uh, Asia, in ASEAN countries, uh, we have already seen uh, some trends growing there. Um, and decisions about eventually manufacturing location um, are much more than uh, just China or not. Uh, and of course, uh, with, especially for companies with uh, supply chains globally um, and uh, also China at the same time, um, considering uh, the consideration around uh, China should not um, be the only consideration for when building up a strategy for supply chain uh, placements. And uh, eventually how China integrates into the overall manufacturing um, and uh, supply chain networks of your overall strategy. This uh, comes last, but uh, uh, also uh, equally important when uh, for SME uh, owner, for SMEs when building up your um, global uh, supply chain strategy. And that is the end of uh, my, my presentation. Uh, thank you for, for your attention. Um, later, we'll of course have Klaus to have a further discussion at Q&A session if you have any questions. Um, without further ado, uh, I will already pass on to our next uh, speaker for today. Um, sorry, before we go uh, here, Again, I listed some uh, a charts from our reports, which could be um, interesting for you. But again, as you can see, we included uh, China's most significant supply chain risk factors. Um, this, of course, we did a survey um, for SME, uh, SMEs. Uh, we also included uh, before pre-COVID uh, years, uh, 2019, and also early 2020 uh, into consideration. Um, there, uh, again, you might see some uh, interesting changes, but uh, unfortunately, we did not uh, have uh, the latest figures from 2022 and from uh, first half of this year. Um, I put it here in the end, instead of including in my, included in my presentation, just for uh, your uh, reference. Um, so now, um, 
let's move on to our um, second speaker, uh, Mr. Alessandro Moali. Um, who has been in China since uh, 2024. Uh, Alessandro, if you allow me to make a short introduction to you. Uh, Alessandro is the founder, general manager of uh, Sismay Tianjin Electric Motor in China. Uh, he has been uh, here since uh, 2024, uh, 2004, led the business to expand and increase uh, the recognition of uh, the brand. The Sismay is an electric motors manufacturer serving both local and overseas markets as a supplier for leading manufacturers of uh, refrigeration compressors. Uh, in April 2023, um, this year, Alessandro Moali was uh, elected the chair of the European Chamber's uh, Tianjin SME Forum. A very brief introduction. Uh, Alessandro, I would like to pass on the floor to you. Thank you, Lian. Thank you. Thank you all for attending uh, uh, offline and online. Uh, we are very happy about the uh, number of attendants today. Uh, it looks like the SME uh, event today is uh, uh, very, very a special topic. In a particular moment, where the supply chain is uh, uh, becoming more and more important for all the companies. Um, as Liam has mentioned. Uh, I'm the general manager of Sisme, who produces electric motors. We are located in Tianjin, half, uh, halfway between Tianjin and Beijing, in, uh, in the district of Wuxing. And uh, uh, over the years, we have developed our own uh, supply chain strategy and management. I will start with some basic concept before to going into the real strategy. So uh, I will not share to you any data, but I will share you, share you some concept, and then we're going to go and discuss later if necessary. Um, we know very well that supply chain management is a key component of a successful business and is the basis of business reliability and results, especially now in this geopolitical scenario where uh, we have a war overseas and where relationship between countries are not very well uh, balanced, let me say. Uh, one of the fundamental uh, uh, idea where that has based our uh, supply chain strategy is that uh, partners, not only suppliers, so we don't treat them as uh, suppliers. This concept is probably not very common uh, in some sector or uh, some geographic areas in the world, for example, Europe, but it plays a fundamental role uh, when we're talking about reliability. Each customer today requests on-time delivery of goods at a cheap price. That's the marketing part. To build and manage supply uh, chain is not simply in buying objects from market or supermarket. We wish it could be so easy, to be honest. It is instead the choice of people running the business with you, supporting you when you need a material or a service, and to satisfy our customer request. Therefore, in our company, we have implemented the concept of a supplier's partnership without limiting the relationship to a supplier-customer relation only. Deep cooperation, on-time information sharing, timely prevention, timely correction of non-standard situations, methodical and systematical review of improvements possibilities have been the topic on which we have been looking for in a relationship with our supply chain partner till now. So it's very highly important to establish this concept for us before moving onwards and a strategy that I'm going to tell. The second is the importance of backup. It could be uh, easy to think, but not easy to think. And the risk need to be always evaluated. Even though uh, you have an ideal partner in, in your supply chain, uh, sooner or later, there will be a moment when, uh, for unpredictable reasons, you would suffer a shortage of material or services. In this competitive market, any shortage could lead to a potential loss of orders. 
especially for our company, if we cannot deliver on time to our customers, we will lose the order. So a single component missing could block the entire line, could block a delivery to a customer, and could make the difference between successful sale or its loss. The supply chain, chain should not rely on a single supply. Therefore, the gap should be properly developed and implemented. That's a requirement I give to my supply chain management. In our company, we have developed at least two suppliers for most of the components, getting all the advantages in price, conditions, negotiations, in a fair competition between suppliers. Um, we used to import material at the very beginning from overseas. The whole import came from overseas at the very beginning. Then we, start, then we started over the years a localization campaign, and it was also accelerated by that. Okay, here we are. COVID experience. We we know very well what, what has happened. And uh, um, I would like to bring you the experience of our company as a, a, a foreign company in China uh, with part of the supply chain uh, overseas. So uh, COVID has impacted the whole supply chain system management worldwide. This one we all know. When the pandemic spread in 2020, most of the sectors suffered a huge shortage of materials and services from the market. The imminent reaction had been to decrease, increase the stock, with the result of congestion of demands in the market, allowing, in some cases, we know very well, speculation on purchase price and conditions. I remember very well some supplier came, ah, oh, here is the new price, take it or leave it. <laughs> so it was pure speculation in some cases, and we know that. I see some faces laughing and saying, yes, yes. So it means I, we were not the only one, uh, at least for those offline today. But I'm pretty sure that someone online is also on the same boat. So uh, at the same time, during the COVID, uh, Parts from overseas were difficult to receive. We all know that China is much faster in reaction than uh, the Western market, but also local suppliers struggle to deliver parts to their various control policies. So supply chain reliability was under stress and not stable. Uh, the increase of the demand for the overstocking uh, and continuous shortage uh, lead to price increase with a huge effect on cash flow situation. So that was the COVID experience that we lived. Uh, on the presentation, you will see some uh, factors impacting and uh, it is quite clear and supporting what I have said so far. So uh, what's next? Uh, um, the COVID gave us a good lesson. Geographic distance matter. So, uh, this was uh, highlighted by COVID, and uh, uh, it, we understood how much is important to have a supply of process. We use pur to purchase components from different cities in China, from Europe, and from America. Uh, for some of the components, Western. Uh, Supplier are the sole supplier we have. So it was very, very challenging for us. Uh, geographic distance, of course, play a strategic role in the supply chain, impacting the lead time, flexibility, logistic cost, and cash flow. We are now launching a campaign to further localize the supply chain around our company with the companies located possibly in the same industrial area and neighborhood. That's what we are launching as a strategy in China. Um, 
that's mainly one of the uh, purchasing strategy that we are launching this year and it will be uh, implemented uh, since, uh, I guess, since November. So um, the next one is uh, from globalization to regionalization. Uh, we know both words, uh, we know what do they mean, uh, and we know that in our market, at least in our sector, uh, the, the market is driving us to move to uh, regionalization uh, supply chain method approach. What do we need to do is uh, uh, follow two different strategies in our group. So what we are approaching is a double strategy. One is in China uh, by localizing further the purchasing. Secondly, is uh, using the attraction of Chinese prices for overseas markets. So we are still relying on Chinese components and on Chinese suppliers to deliver parts overseas. Especially now, where European uh, suppliers are struggling in not in terms of capacity, but in terms of cost due to the war. And uh, in the US, uh, due to the uh, current, uh, um, I don't want to be so political, but the current country management is not running that well as they expect. So um, let's see with the election of 2024 what will happen. But uh, uh, so far, we have been seeing that uh, the components from uh, overseas are much, uh, much more expensive than uh, the components from China. So uh, one of the projects we are launching is uh, the uh, localization from China to China and uh, the export from China to Europe and from China to US. Um, so, as I mentioned, geographic distance plays a, a strategic role, but not always, are always a guarantee of saving and reliability. Different supply chain locations uh, play a strategic role and apply main value of our cost. So uh, basically, also for our local strategy, we are not only thinking to localize the components, near our company, but also to evaluate other Chinese suppliers, uh, depending on the logistic cost you were mentioning before. And it's one of the aspects that has to be evaluated. And uh, it could be a constraint, especially in particular situation like it was in COVID. So uh, we will continue to search uh, for suppliers in the market, attending the various fairs, networking uh, activities, uh, such as the Chamber events, uh, and keep an open eye on the market. That's um, how we are going to set our global and local strategy. Uh, and uh, that's, I think, will be the short Term and short term strategy. For the long term strategy, it depends on the development of the geopolitical situation. That's uh, basically my contribute for today's uh, event. And uh, if further question might be very, very welcome by everyone on the offline and online. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alessandro. Um, and during your presentation, I already see, uh, I cannot unfortunately see online participants, but I see offline here. We have many uh, of our participants either nodding, smiling, or having a frowning face. Uh, so I, I believe later on we'll have uh, the chance to uh, further discuss uh, on what uh, you have shared with us today. Um, and now I would like to already pass on to the next uh, speaker uh, for today, Miss uh, Cindy Zhang. Um, and also a very quick introduction, uh, if I may. 
Ms. Cindy John is the CFO of Fargo Electronic uh, in Tianjin. Uh, Cindy has, sorry, please. Now it works. Um, Cindy has uh, majored in international banking and professional accounting uh, at Nankai University, and she has also been the CFO of Vago Electronics um, since uh, 2015. Uh, Cindy is in charge of HR, finance, uh, supply chain, and EHS departments, uh, and is the chair of board for uh, legal representatives of M&M Software in Suzhou, uh, a Vago Group company since uh, October. Uh, 2020, and Cindy served as chair of uh, three companies of uh, Turk in Tianjin from 2008 to 2008 to 2014. Um, and from May uh, 2022 to June 20, uh, 2008, uh, she was the board of directors uh, and business operation controller for Echo Lin in Tianjin. And from 1992, that was again a long time ago. Uh, Cindy also worked uh, with HSBC and LVMH uh, in Shanghai. In May this year, Cindy has joined uh, the board uh, of the European Chamber in Tianjin. Um, Cindy, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone, uh, both online and uh, offline. And thank you for your time to join in this similar for this hot topic for the supply chain strategy uh, shift. I feel so happy to share the insight and perspective uh, with uh, everyone of you. After my presentation, feel free to ask any questions. First of all, I give a quick glimpse uh, of my own company, Vago. Uh, it is a traditional middle-sized German family companies. Um, it's a uh, for worldwide. We are the top three in the terminal block. Another two uh, leaders also from uh, Germany. Um, so we founded 1951, global employee 9,000, and uh, milestone in 2022, we achieved globally Euro 1.3 um, billion. Um, so overall, uh, our industry covered to the right-hand side, you can see the railway, energy, technology, marine, building, life, automobile, and elevator. It, my company is also located uh, in Wuqin, um, because I know uh, some participants today, uh, we are going to invest something uh, in China, but I could share at the beginning why we have this investment in, in Tianjin. First of all, is uh, Tianjin have the port, a uh, top 10 port uh, globally, and at the same time, have a very good universities in Tianjin, like Tianjin University and Nankai University. Um, I'm not trying to promotion for Tianjin, but I have to tell some truths. Uh, for, for Tianjin. At the same time, uh, Tianjin have the same attitude, uh, geographic attitude uh, with my uh, headquarter in Germany. So that means uh, in the humidity, uh, dry of these climates, and it's that we, we roughly have the same uh, degree uh, uh, with Germany. And number uh, four is uh, because of the top four, um, directly managed by the central government um, that Tianjin have a very good base for both uh, light industry and heavy industry. That means that it's full of the results of a blue color of workers. And then the last reason is Tianjin is not Shanghai, Beijing, it's not the uh, North uh, East. That means for the cost wise, the size of the city is uh, kind of in the, in the middle. That means not very expensive, um, like uh, Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou and Shenzhen at the same time, uh, not like uh, Northeast, um, like, or something like this, uh, uh, poor in some resource. Yeah, this is the main reason. 
So my part cover four, uh, we usually generate information of in our company's view, we see our local for local, or I can see China for China, our development fees, some key figures and targets, and uh, talk about the localization. This is inevitable topic we have to say, raw material 1.0, we call that, and uh, localization 2.0, production relocation and future discussions. Um, I like this statement, market in China is too big to avoid and too big to fail. Um, actually during the localization interview <laughs> for some member company, um, I clearly remember some companies turn over and profitability contribution uh, in China. Um, for their global contributions, uh, more than 40 or 45 percent, also include a profit contribution. So, such big, um, significant contribution, both for turnover and profit, um, if you cannot avoid investment, continual investment in China. And it's obviously, if you lose China, you lose Asia Pacific, or even you lose your whole market. So this is a um, very significant um, uh, effect for your contribution uh, for the market in China. I guess this is the precondition um, we talk about uh, during COVID, we talk about decoupling and then we move to de-risking. That this is the base, it's a too big market in China. Um, now we, we just see um, the overview uh, for the development of why um, economically it is unrealistic to have a full decoupling from China. You see 1991 for APEC, 2001 WTO, and then you see uh, for a lot of foreigners, uh, they can easily see by the chance they take a high-speed train. 2008 Olympic only fourth grid line, 2022 and it just goes quickly to 27 sub grid line. This is um, in every, especially the Western countries, it is a kind of, a, uh, you cannot believe the development is such quick. And, uh, and then the containment policy uh, coming from both uh, Mr. Trump and Biden, of this China, um, like the Zhongxin and, and, and Huawei. And for the counter strategy, China has increasing influence by Belt and Road Initiative, um, as well as in Western, we call the Industry Performance Bureau, and in China, we, pay, we call it Made in China 2025. And uh, I know uh, this year uh, is economic recession and a lot of companies suffered a loss both in the turnover and in the PNL. But we also find that uh, if you have an early deployment in the correct pillar, you still have a very good chance to uh, have the increase. Um, because my company is in the automation industry. I just talk about uh, the three major category um, actually, everybody should make earlier deployment in the battery, semiconductor, and the solar. Um, okay, doesn't matter. Um, so you can see for the vehicle, for the energy, uh, these kind of figures, uh, they have um, really dramatically increased rate. Um, the, you, you can see for the Lisman battery and for the lead battery shipment, even increase by 97%. For global total shipment is taking for nearly 70%. And forecast in 2030, global sales and thesis, the new energy vehicle will reach 52 million. It's really a lot. And the last, um, Expect in 2030, the global lead battery reach uh, this uh, 6080 uh, gigawatts. SIGA, SIGA it means year by year increase 22.8%. So it's a good business. Semiconductor, it's the same. 
if we just look at it, uh, the last paragraph, focus 2023, 20, uh, globally, semiconductor market will have a decline by 4.1%. Then China will have still significant plant increase. And for solar, we have everybody uh, have had to notice that uh, China is the largest uh, TV equipment market, Guangfu. Uh, so um, uh, forecast 2023, global TV equipment market will be 50 billion. Um, China's uh, portion account for nearly uh, 97. Um, and also, I, I want to mention during our LPP interview, uh, some automation company, if the achieve increase for 22 to 21 and 21 to 20, if their uh, increase is over 30%, no doubt they all have an early deployment in this uh, three uh, pillar um, um, in industry. You have a chance. Um, my presentation a little bit um, down to earth. I, I, I talk about uh, um, each company that means um, our bubble, China and Japan and USA and the EU, those are the proportion pro for the global wise. Um, actually, in, in my last company, I work for Turk, it's also an automation company. We take uh, almost one third I mean, uh, my, my last time we took China of the global wide. But for Wago China, we only take, uh, you see, less 10%. Uh, it's really a very a little. That means we have a huge potential market we never enter into. And then to the right hand side, our two competitors, Phoenix, um, the China part take 11%, and White Miller have a, a 20%. Um, and then for the um, SIGA, you see the different uh, the curve that uh, we only have a green line with SIGA only have uh, uh, 7% from this uh, back to uh, five years. And for uh, Red Miller uh, have a higher 15% and brown color curve of Phoenix 11. That means we are behind our competitor, why? And to the downside, you can see R&D headcount in China. We have a zero R&D, but our com two competitors have a 70 headcount, 100 headcount in R&D. So we are really very strong. And the two pictures actually um, for the wet Miller is also a German uh, automation company. Actually in the turnover wise, uh, we roughly the same, but to the uh, uh, down and the right hand side, they do 100, uh, 150 million US dollar investment in this year, even in this uh, ideology and geopolitical um, situation. They're still keeping doing uh, more investment in China, including the R&D investment in Suzhou. And so you see, this is a different. We are facing the same market, but our reaction is quite different. Um, some companies withdraw or doing more observation, but somebody is doing quick um, uh, milestone. Um, this is our uh, comparison uh, with uh, five, one, two, uh, five companies. Uh, for the first, uh, inno Innovins, at the Chinese name we call it Huichuan. We call it another Huawei in China automation market. Um, so the, you see the R&D headcount, they have a 4,200. Hongfa is a, a little small Huawei uh, in, in China uh, automation. They have a, a 1,600 at Obago, <laughs> we have a zero. And Dexin is also Supu, is a local uh, Chinese uh, automation company. And it's in for the turnover wise, for the turnover wise, you can see the innovance of Huichuan and 2022. Uh, uh, this is in a unit, is a million. So let's put it in a simple because a lot of people by identifying to know or uh, have a little difficult if it's a not finance people, that means 220, 220. The first line uh, 
it's a really, really uh, quite a lot. So what we want to see is that during the three year COVID and China is kind of isolated with the world. When the door is open, um, I remember this uh, in, the, in, in the last month of September in Shanghai, we have international aviation industry exhibition. A lot of uh, foreign uh, companies, they have the visitor from head office. They, they feel very big uh, a surprise because of uh, three years they didn't come to China, visit China, and then they find, oh my God, so quick R&D and the product already on the market is only for the past three years during the COVID. So local company have uh, made incredible uh, and growth, um, growth uh, uh, in China. And uh, also uh, local company, because their decision uh, chain is uh, quick, it's not like international companies, they have a lot of uh, hierarchy and reporting lines, so that goes into a quick reporting, uh, a quick decision power um, and local, that means uh, to catch the innovation trend and ramp up uh, R&D spending very quickly. Um, I showed an example like a Dexin, uh, it's also a local uh, Chinese uh, uh, competitor. They have developed their new mass trip design and already on the market and, and uh, all of the, the foreign automation companies, they still didn't believe this is already on the market. So this is really, um, I would say, a gap for the identification of uh, how strong of a Chinese local uh, supplier. Um, actually, I don't want to show this, but uh, it's, it doesn't matter. Um, we have a uh, seventy percent of all, all all the turnover is domestic and uh, export is thirty percent. But next year. And the uh, next two years, it's a 30% will be even less and less because the intergroup that is our export to intergroup now have the reallocation to India more because the Indian plant uh, have the same production capacity. Um, so this is inevitable um, for production orders. And also for our domestic market, even we have a 70%, but inclusive 60% is treating from headquarters. That means it's not what we produce locally. What we can do? Anything for what we can decide is only 70 times 40%, this 28% is what we what, what, what we can do something. Because for the export order is given by headquarters. And by the domestic market, the most sellable product actually is a trading from head office. So you can see the big difference. Now we're talking about the supply chain that we rely, rely on so much for, for, the, for, for, the, for the head office. And, uh, we have a very uh, little um, room to play so for the time being. So we really uh, treated ourselves like extended workbench of Germany. So this is our, we position ourselves. Strategy in CN that uh, if, if we still want to make success, um, first a speed, that uh, localization rate um, of the new pot of blue, uh, that means we have to have a lot of a new product that is sellable in the local market and produce in China, but not sellable in the market, but produce in the other um, uh, countries. This doesn't make any of them sense for us. And this ability to understand customer, respond to uh, the customer, that means you have to be very strong uh, customized ability. So this too is the speed wise. And the local position power, it's always like because the foreign company is worrying the IP um, if they're controlled by China. Um, if someday some war happened, how about my supply chain and our cash and capital and retain earning? Also, a lot of these chemical worries and this, uh, they diminish the local decision power. But now if we really want to uh, make something in China, we want to have a um, better local position power. Um, that means the management way should change from 
centralized to de decentralized. That means the local people, you understand China, you know market, you know the government relationship. That means the local management team should get more power, but not copy the head office management approach to local. It doesn't work. The second is product management. Um, you have to collect all the market, what is the most sellable uh, product. At the same time, we can depend on our R&D. If you don't have R&D, we have to set up our R&D so for the decision uh, making. And also function process um, we set up before. I, I think a lot of foreign companies they have very advanced machine, very advanced facility and plant. Everything is expensive. And this, you cannot com compare uh, with this local um, um, company because they're, they, they don't have so much advanced uh, machine in the facility as a foreign company. That means that you have a more um, expensive negotiation and especially by power. And, and then you, it's, you would face a challenge how to compete with the uh, local uh, supplier. Good enough portfolio, that means a good enough product portfolio. So um, overall, uh, we, we summarize this model, business model. We must be supported by the local competition. That we, we really have to identify what is the local competition, and then to determine what is the correct for the business model. But previously, our business model is only according to the legacy market rules and the traditional market rules. And now the market is changing. The local competitor is so strong. For the localization, the benefits peak the year in time, the type of purchase is payment cost saving, quality trial cost around satisfaction, safeguard production. Um, what are we doing now? <laughs> Before uh, Ukraine and Russia's war, uh, we already start to do the raw material localization thing because we relied on Germany too much. Uh, we call it 1.0. Localization 2.0 is production relocation. That means if this product main market in China were not produced in China rather than produced in Germany, we call it the reallocation. And then we want to have a quick win, and then we have to uh, think about something else. The localization 3.0 that uh, we, will, we will do um, something like uh, we find a good product in China. We use our own sales channel to be the agent for even the local good sellable product, even as a local brand, even they are foreign company. So what? Localization 4.0. We have a, a, a lot of free capacity because it's here. Uh, we don't have a, so much orders, both from domestic and the intergroup. So why not we do OEM? For both international product and local product, we have to use it. It's on idle. So we have to change our mind for that. Um, I like this slide. This is you can uh, make diagnosis for your company to evaluate what is the level of your company's uh, globalization development phase. We call the 4D uh, um, methodology design, R&D, deployment. Do you have a, a, a deployment for resource investment product price and delivery? Is your country the um, supply chain center for Asia Pacific? And decision, your um, decision power, if you still uh, have a highly centralized by head, head office. You can only do what they are told you to do and then you don't have any decision power. And then we evaluate ourselves as a local position uh, one from zero. And, but, but then I know a lot of uh, foreign companies, uh, two from zero, three from zero, something like this. But the higher you have and the higher, um, I mean, the resilience you have. Yeah, quick wheel. And just to see the blue color is we relied on all the purchase from uh, 
raw materials, semi-finished foods, and 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 uh, finished finished foods. Really, this is a big part from from German um, for the uh, local purchase. It's the yellow part, very steep. <coughs> We show an example, the two company, very famous. They, they use a 10 years, both companies use a 10 years to make a successful speech for the purchase overseas local, 8020 to 2080, Bistol and uh, Danfoss. So they, they, they make it uh, 10 years ago and now they don't have to face such big challenge as we did. Our target is in the next three to five years, we want to have a 50% of the local purchase. This is our goal. Yeah, this is our domestic sales. You can see the increase of our trading booth. We act like a kind of an agent. You, you know, this this is all the sales to know where it's not made. It's not made by our own, but it's headquarter um, made to us. The quick links for the single parts finished food. We just uh, do the simulation that if it is produced by China, for example, we have the one which inject parts. If we don't do a through Vago Germany and the Switzerland, one year we can save 16. One six million because when we buy this semi we finish goods and they charge some margin to us and also we have duty and freight and just kind of things. <clears throat> for all the uh, because for the uh, for protection of our, our product series for all the top sales that means a sales good in China there are all the trading goods that German make it for us. But this is more interesting than for the one one product series. The yellow part is uh, uh, made by Germany, and the blue part is uh, made by us. And so, actually, for the supply chain point of view, there's a lot of improvement to do. And if if um, if some blue is obvious there, but why would we still need some treating uh, goods from overseas? The KP in China all. And um, so, so um, you, you can check with your uh, registration, uh, local registration government. We are told that if we set up the sales company to, uh, to be the agent uh, for the other brand, uh, we could have 67% uh, that the tax we uh, uh, pay to the, the the local registration area. That part we can get a sixty seventy percent back with yeah. support and localization four point zero. That is our um, oh yeah definitely we need um, our R and D person to identify and what product we can do use our own machine. Yeah. This is my part. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your sharing, Cindy. Um, if I may, this uh, almost uh, you can use uh, to present to your board of director for Wago in Germany to convince them to increase uh, the investments in uh, in China in R and D. Uh, but very interesting sharing indeed from uh, a perspective of a Chinese branch of a multinational, how you um, are recognizing the competitiveness, the growing competitiveness of local players, of local suppliers. Um, but also, I think uh, what has also been <clears throat> mentioned by Alessandro earlier is the importance of market adjacency. So be in the market, uh, adapt to the market, and um, do what you do best uh, and to see how it matches with uh, the market demands. Um, I would now like us to already move into the Q&A session. Um, 
For those of you who are seeing this uh, screen online, uh, you are also invited to uh, quickly scan the QR uh, on, the, on, on this uh, slide to give us your feedback uh, because we at the SME Center uh, we do value your feedback uh, for today's session, also to uh, the webinars we organize. Um, let me quickly check the screen platform to see if we have any questions from our online Sorry. audience. Yes, please. Okay, to ask here. It's okay to ask here. Okay. Yes, and thank you for your presentation. Actually, I have one question for each of you. The first is to Mr. the chat. I, it's quite interesting, actually. Your your last slide is your you sure survey of your SME, right? Uh, but I, I noticed the terms is in the 2019 to 2022, uh, which is quite interesting. I say in 2019, someone they're talking about the cost in China is very high, but in the research in 2022, the percentage is lower, getting lower. So uh, usually for we are partner of a supply for, for so many manufacturers, right? As a global logistics company, so we're. Usually, we are not using the data from 2020 to 2022 because we see the pandemic situation. It's, it's an abnormal situation for the economy. So we usually have a baseline of 2019 to do this research. So my question is, uh, when are you going to, to do the next survey for the real case in 2023? I think it's more reflecting the new the severe situation. Yeah, uh, again, I think to provide a very short answer, data are collected to be compared. And of course, the uh, reason why I did not include that slide in there is that the relevance of that slide might not apply to the current uh, circumstances anymore. For the future, uh, again, I think it's worth taking into account of what happened uh, during COVID days because some shifts are not reversible. Some shifts are permanent and the situation will develop from there. It's still worth including those uh, yeah. years and impacts uh, led by COVID-19. But of course, we look at the present uh, for, for us to be able to make predictions for the future. OK, thank you. Uh, second question to Mr. Alessandro. So is regarding your mention about the, the, the shift, you're talking about the concept is to, uh, to find alternative solution, actually to back up. So for the backup solution, which I believe that is not really relocation, it's just like risk management, right? It's just like in, a, in an emergency situation that you need a backup, which is a sunk cost because uh, you need to prepare for the two, two locations for the manufacturer or to market, which is uh, maybe not close to your supplier or either close to your, to your customers. So uh, I'm not sure if you experienced could that pandemic in China. So if you're reassessed again, I mean, compared to the pre-COVID-19 time, do you think that the shift or will continue or how do we access the market here? Okay, so thank you for your question. Very, very interesting topic because it was not mentioned very clearly. Yeah. So, uh, we have started the uh, localization in uh, 2009. So actually, since 2005, we have started the localization. Since the very beginning in 2004, we used to receive all the components from Italy yeah. with a huge cost of transportation for the equipment plant. Then uh, we have defined to further localize because cost wise is much more. Yeah. Uh, pandemic has given us the final input to localize perfectly, uh, not only on supply chain, as uh, Cindy was mentioning, also we are thinking about localization of our digital and other part. Uh, so we will be driven on a localization uh, project further, not only due to pandemic, because it was well established before. And yes, it's part of the risk management, as you very well pointed out, but it's uh, uh, actually is going to be to have a backup is also important due to the fact that we have, uh, as I mentioned before, oversee sole supply. And that's uh, really a challenge when uh, you talk about price, 
and you talk about negotiation, you don't have any power and you just obey to their law. So uh, yes, it's uh, it's part of the risk management, but it's also part of uh, localization in terms of safety of our structure. Okay. okay. Yeah. And the third question will be to Cindy. Right? Yes. Uh, I think it's a very good piece you're talking about the too big to win and too big to fail. Right? Yeah, yeah. This is quite an interesting topic. And I also show the, <coughs> the one who mark, uh, marketing share in China compared to the Europe and the US market. I think, uh, I think you mentioned about in China, you, you have ambitions to explore yeah. your business okay. share in China. So in that part, uh, how will you, will you evaluate the, your, your future strategy in China? We are going to spend, expand your, your footprint or you're going to, you mentioned about shift some production line to the Indian, so. Yes, get this point. Yes. Uh, we want to uh, set up R&D center. It's, uh, we, we don't have any other option that we, we have to do that because uh, this presentation is, uh, we're going to show the, before you can see the both local competitor and our international competitor how strong are their R and D because we have a very advanced machinery, the CBT and the simple blue color and what we lack of R and D and uh, our shareholder is uh, very strong uh, financially and in, in, in Germany so we, we will do this uh, investment as. We already talk about that if we lose China, we lose Asia Pacific, and if we lose the uh, most market. But we have to do this now. And uh, even we are a little bit late, but better than nothing. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for the questions. Um, we do have uh, also a question from online participants uh, from Boshan. Is this switch for localization? New topic, or it is common sense of companies who understand what is going on in China? Oh. Um, um, okay, uh, let me try. Uh, I think it's a, uh, it more depends on your market share of China uh, towards its whole uh, global price. If you have a very large market share uh, in China, and uh, maybe you have some other. Uh, strategy, but if you are very strong in China, let's say you take uh, 20% above of some profit, so more than 20% that you have to continually invest in China because nobody wants to lose the market. In China. Um, this is my understanding, but overall, I think um, this is a, a common uh, understanding for topic and for every company. I, I can do support what Cindy is saying because uh, we work for both expert and, uh, and local market, but uh, to be competitive and to be uh, competitive not only on the local market, but uh, also on KFC because our competitors are easily exporting products overseas, uh, we have to launch a further localization. And as mentioned, localization related for the supply chain, as we were discussing today, but yeah. also for R and D, as you mentioned, it's a common point for uh, European or Western uh, enterprises in China not to have R and D. And I remember that uh, uh, one, when I was in a fair, in a China refrigeration, and one of the customer uh, point out the fact that uh, some of the company. Don't have don't have a R and D in China, and the, some of the Europeans can have R and D in Europe and say, "Hey guys, it's not the right way to approach Chinese market." Exactly. So, and uh, being in China as a foreigner, I can confirm it. Uh, necessary to localize to have a winning strategy. Yeah, uh, if I may compliment with uh, from SME perspective because. I understand today that we, we do have uh, also um, participants from uh, Europe, uh, European SMEs joining us online from Europe, uh, some of which might not be on the market uh, yet, some of which might be sourcing from China, some of which might be considering to uh, place their supply chain uh, in China. But 
Um, also, there are companies uh, who are already here, SMEs uh, who are already operating in China, and I believe those uh, will be the ones that are normally nodding uh, every time when uh, those of you are talking. But uh, of course, some of uh, the companies might also now starting to have a frowning face. Uh, is China really like that now? Uh, and I might let out from the market. Uh, do I still have a chance to enter the market? Or it might also be uh, uh, positive to see uh, the growing competitiveness of the local R&D, of R&D from local players for those uh, companies who are sourcing from China. So it's going to be a mix uh, of happiness, of bitterness, for sure, for SMEs in China. I'm trying to uh, also uh, answer that question now, uh, address to the audience, uh, or to, the, to the speaker, sorry. <clears throat> when do you think the situation in EU will improve? Uh, that's again not an easy question uh, to answer. In the recent geopolitical happening, uh, it's hard to say. Uh, for sure, not in 2024. Which is uh, three three months from now, yes. <laughs> okay, uh, let me complete my answer. Not till the end of 2024. Um, okay. Uh, in the meantime, we have one more question coming in. What is your information about companies uh, leaving China? What is what? What is your information, or what is uh, or how what, how much do you know about companies who are leaving China? Yeah, after COVID, uh, we we have uh, understood that many companies, overseas companies, decided to leave China. Frightened by the uh, restriction that were implemented during the pandemic. Uh, of course, their business is probably uh, located in their home country or like less than that. So it makes sense for them to uh, relocate on where they have business, where they have sales. But uh, this doesn't mean that uh, the uh, supply chain uh, should be relocated as well. And they could keep any anyway and anyhow the supply chain in China because it's more competitive than we But anyway, yes, there has been a big batch of companies leaving China after pandemic, right after pandemic. Anything you would like to add, Cindy? Well, um, somebody left, somebody still coming here. This is the fact. Yeah, uh, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and I think it's about uh, time we close today's uh, session. Um, thank you very much for uh, all our participants uh, who join us today offline here in Tianjin, but also online. Uh, you are encouraged to uh, follow. Uh, our uh, events, activities organized by the USCB Center and the European Chamber. This is definitely not going to be the last time uh, in the recent uh, months we are organizing something on this very topic, supply chain shifts. Uh, please stay in touch with us uh, and uh, attend uh, the future activities. Before we go uh, for the on uh, offline participants, I would like to uh, thank you again, Alessandro and Cindy, for uh, your sharing. Uh, let's give uh, both of them a round, uh, big round of applause uh, to close today's session.